Hi, this is Tim Ives, director of photography of Fosse Burden and Stranger Things. You're listening to me on The Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions. And this is The Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals in the video production and filmmaking industries. Today, we learn all about the making of Stranger Things Season 3 with director of photography Tim Ives. Learn how Tim shot and lit the series, including the Starcourt Mall, action sequences, why he chose to shoot large format for Season 3, and so much more. The Go Creative Show is supported by Rule Boston Camera, Hedge.Video, Shutterstock, Magnanimous Rentals, and PremiumBeat.com. Premium, royalty-free music, and sound. So I am a huge fan of Stranger Things. I loved season one and two and three for me was highly anticipated, you know, um, for really everybody. Everybody was waiting for it. They're all excited. Fourth of July weekend comes up. Here it goes. It's released. Got to tell you, I think this season completely nailed it on all fronts. Editing, sound design, of course, the performances, the cinematography, obviously. We're going to talk a lot about that today. Um, But everything, costuming and set design and just... It was flawless from start to finish, and I'm just such a huge fan of this show, and it gets better uh, season after season. Now, in this episode, we've got Tim Ives, the director of photography, and um, Tim, uh, more than any other guest that we've had on, had the most audience questions. Um, You guys really uh, took to our Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and asked a whole bunch of questions for Tim, and we incorporate so many of them in this show. They were great questions, and um, you guys are going to be happy because A lot of your questions will be answered, that's for sure. Uh, Now, this is a new thing we're doing on the show, so if you aren't following us on social media, please do, because we're going to let you know when we have upcoming guests, and it'll give you the opportunity to have your voice heard on the show. Now, before we get into our interview, I just want to take a moment and talk about Shutterstock, because they have something new. Uh, Recently, they introduced Elements. Now, what Elements are is they're thousands of cinema-grade video effects for filmmakers, now, these are, these are not some chintzy little effects. These are broadcast quality video effects, and they're created by industry professionals, um, including 4K lens flares, um, transitions, uh, captivating video kits that have things like smoke and fire explosions and more. You can check them all out at Shutterstock.com. This is a toolkit for filmmakers that want to incorporate more video effects into their projects. And uh, who doesn't, Right. So even if you're a just an amateur that just wants to explore, this is a great option. The pricing is not bad at all. And of course, if you're professionals, then you can really appreciate the high quality of these Shutterstock elements. Now, obviously, Shutterstock is known for their royalty-free video clips and audio and their blog that I've talked about. But this is something new, and I strongly encourage you to check it out. You get there at Shutterstock.com. Uh, You hover over the footage tab, and right there in the dropdown is Elements. So go there, download a few, try them on your projects, and you're absolutely going to love them. Okay, we've got so much to dig into. I can't wait to start, so let's get right to it. With the Director of Photography for Stranger Things 1, 2, and 3, Tim Ives. So I'm here with Tim Ives, the Director of Photography for Stranger Things Season three, as well as two and one. This is your third appearance on the show, Tim, and we can't be happier. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to be here again, Ben. Good morning. I got to tell you, season three is, it's just so good. It's like, I loved season one. I love season two. There, there is a big difference in season three. I don't know if it's the editing or the sound design. Um, certainly the cinematography is always great, but like, it's just, it really found a groove this season even better than the previous two. It's so fast paced and energy and oh my God, I just love it. I'm, I'm so glad. Yeah. There, there's a bunch of reasons why I think uh, you're, 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 you're thinking, um, thinking that. And uh, one of them is which, you know, the, the story takes place in the summer for the first time ever. The kids are on vacation and uh, the Duffer brothers wanted it to be, wanted the show to feel more colorful and alive and really represent like a full on summertime, colorful, 1985, bring on the neon and the wardrobe kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, and with looking to push it forward too, we also, um, well, you know, I tested our, our usual red cameras, but I also came up with uh, 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 the idea of shooting large format. Um, and red had uh, 
had their new uh, Monstro sensor out. We tested that with the new Leica large format glass. Uh, so the consistency is there with the same uh, manufacturers of the tools, but we went large format, which I, I think uh, you can you can see right off the bat. Um, in the show, as far as uh, the grandness and the uh, the the, uh, the look the look of it, that it's 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 kind of morphed into something new, uh, but still holds uh, holds back to to the uh, traditions of Stranger Things. What does that give you? Like by shooting large format, what does that afford you? And how's it how's it different than I guess the 4K or 5K that you've shot previous? Well, it's a larger negative space. So uh, with that in mind, you have less depth of field, um, and you have uh, finer detail. Um, so. So I was able to shoot daytime exteriors and have like a relatively skinny focus and keep it very filmic looking while really shooting under the harsh sun, like uh, in the opening of season three, the the pool scene um, was really just a, you know, harsh sun. We wanted it to feel hot. Uh, the brothers wanted that, that, that feeling. Uh, so, um, you know, I think it, I was able to keep it cinematic looking while at the same time, you know, using fairly harsh lighting, to be honest. Can you give us like just a general estimate, or maybe you know the exact number? What is the difference between a super thirty-five um, negative size versus a full-frame negative size? Oh gosh, that's a technical thing I, that I don't have right in front of me right now. I'm so sorry to say, but it's uh, if you think of going from super eight millimeter to sixteen millimeter to thirty-five millimeter, you know you you get a better structure in your image uh, all the way as you start moving up. And and look, I love Super 8. Uh, it looks awesome. I love that big chunky grain. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the more you further you move away from that, basically, the the tighter the image gets. Um, you know, and it's also tricky too in this age of digital cinema to not let it get too digital looking uh, because it is such a fine image. And I know some shows uh, uh, use a lot of smoke. We do we do on Stranger Things as well for our our, our interiors. Um, and some exteriors too. That helps kind of grid it down to, to, to make it feel, keep the, the film feel alive. But, um, you know, ultimately it gives you, it gives the viewer kind of a, 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 a bigger sense of, um, you know, something bigger to look at really. Uh, I don't really know how to explain it other than that. I think, you know, yeah. watching season three against season two, you can, you can see that the, the, I think that the, the characters leap off the screen a little bit more. Yeah, you'd mentioned using smoke in the show. Are are there other things that you do to kind of give something that is that's super super sharp and super detailed a little bit more of that you know filmic look versus less digital? It was the most poorly constructed question ever, but that's fine. I think you understood <laughs> what I meant. <laughs> like it's I, not. I'll, yeah. I'll try to match that with a poorly constructed <laughs> answer, but but uh, uh, you know I. I think as always, I just try to shoot uh, uh, fairly wide open between a two and a two eight and a half. Although I got to say, um, I got to back up a bit because that's how I did that with with regular thirty five uh, digital. But now these lenses are a little bit slower, um, so we just try to shoot as as close to a stop within wide open as each lens can can offer. Um, and mm. sometimes that's at, in large format. That's like a three five or or a four or uh, you know some lenses are still a little bit faster, but that that gives me that um, that isolation of the character and the isolation of focus, so that if I'm on a certain character, not everything in the background is 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 sharp, and it brings you into um, whatever the character uh, we're focusing on is is doing and saying, and that's that's something that I think is 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 important uh, for me at least in digital photography to keep that film, that film spirit alive. So between that and, and lighting as naturally as I can, even in this supernatural show, I think, um, contributes to, to that. What about filters? You use a lot of filters on, on the front of your lens? I, I don't use any. None at all? N- no. Oh, I use, um, I use, uh, one very slight diffusion filter. It's in the eighth black promised. Uh, and that's just to get the highlights blooming a little bit which is sort of a signature look on Stranger Things. Yeah. Uh, and that mostly uh, shows itself at night with, with headlights and street lights and flashlights and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, you, I, we've been asking our, uh, our listeners to send in their questions. You know, when we have guests coming on, you by far had the most amount of audience questions. I mean, everywhere, oh everywhere we posted, um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, people just want to know about how this show came to be <laughs> and, and, and how it looks. And I think there's just so much interest in Stranger Things. It's, uh, it's incredible. I mean, it's a great show. 
Um, you know, you've been on it since the very beginning. How does it feel from your perspective to be on something that just every season it's, it's a step up. It's a step up. People are more interested. It, it hasn't seemed to die down at all. Well, it's a testament to the Duffer brothers writing, um, and our, our cast, uh, uh, really that the show is so successful. Um, um, and their vision, I have to say, uh, as well, we, we, it's a collaboration, but it's not directionless. It comes straight from the Duffer brothers and their vision from day one of this show, I think has been, um, remarkable. It's been, uh, it's been forward thinking. Um, it's been heartfelt and, uh, all that is reflected in, um, the, 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 the work behind, behind the scenes. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's been a remarkable, uh, show to be a part of, um, and, uh, certainly a highlight of my career, uh, so far. Um, and maybe, maybe the highlight of my career, cause it's, it's, it's a, it's basically a phenomenon that nobody could have predicted. I knew the show was going to be great. I really believed it, but I could not have predicted the response that, um, that it's gotten. I don't think anybody could have, uh, um, but, uh, it's been, it's been amazing to be a part of this show. And, uh, and, and the kids, um, you, you've seen them grow up. I mean, literally seen them grow up. And I think what's so great about the show is it, it's it, like, it's working regardless of their age. As they grow, the storylines just get a little bit more adult. You're growing with them. It doesn't have that feeling like, you know, sitcoms would where once the kids grow up, it just sort of goes stale it's you re- the show really follows them and works with them at whatever age that they are is what I've been seeing. I would agree with you on that. And, um, you know, so again, that, uh, you know, when the, when the, when the guys and the bros write for each season, they take that in mind that their kids are not, uh, uh, babies anymore. And they're going through things that teenagers go through and, um, in this sort of, you know, while telling the story it, to me, it's always, it's always been about, uh, uh, kids sticking together and the love they have for each other and, um, the bond, the, the bonds that, that, that brings as far as, um, uh, uh, how you relate to one another and how you you got each other's back. And that's always been the, been the greatest thing for me, uh, in this show is, is watching, watching that, that story unfold. People are really resonating with this eighties look and you guys, I mean, it's always kind of been an eighties show, but I feel like you've leaned into it more this season than ever before. And I want to start with an audience question from Patrick um, uh, Kisaki. Sorry if I screwed it up. I will screw it up uh, with all of these names, I'm sure. Um, He wants to know, he wants us to basically just be walked through the process of determining the look and feel for this series. Now, I know you've been on twice before. You don't have to go all the way back to the beginning. I think let's focus on this season and how it's different than previous. Um, I think that's probably a good way to start and we can kind of take it from there. Oh, that's a good question from Patrick. I, I think, you know, um, in, in wanting to feel fresh and wanting to feel, uh, 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 not stale and not rely on our past as much as, uh, we possibly can. Um, you know, like I mentioned a minute ago, the idea of this show this year is that it's, it's set in, in summer, which offers up more possibilities for us to, to really, uh, evolve the look of the show. In the past, we've, uh, we've taken place over the course of a, a school year. And also certainly in season one, where things were less optimistic and maybe a little scary. We, 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 that was reflected, you know, in wardrobe reflected in darker lighting, uh, reflected, um, in, uh, in the storyline. And, and now that we're solidly in the eighties and we've seen these kids and we're familiar with them and we wanted to start out having fun, we were able to be a little bit brighter at times. I mean, not always, but certainly yeah. our daytime exteriors. Um, there's still a, that the darkness that lies underneath everything in the show. Um, but you know, the, the clothing as well, uh, uh, really shows is very different this year. Um, Amy Paris is our costume designer and she, uh, really brought a lot of, a lot of color to the show. I remember when I first got in to Atlanta to meet with her this year and she showed me what she was what she was up to at first I was like, wow, this is really different. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, uh, and indeed it is. And I think it's just absolutely a uh, genius what she brought to it this, this year and really helped me embrace that without being, you know, uh, it can be a little scary when you're asked to go with, with neon colors and, and, and a brighter look. Uh, it's usually not conducive with, uh, 
in incredible cinematography or, or, or a great, a great look, but, in, but we managed to, uh, to, I think, you know, make, make it look as, as good as the, show, as the show's ever been. Um, and at the same time, moving it forward too. Uh, I don't know if I missed anything in that answer to Patrick's question, but, um, you know, that, that would help, that, that helped us to, uh, get a little, you know, evolve the look this, this year. And I think that makes sense. I mean, one, one of the key, um, elements this season that I think really stands out is the use of neon, uh, certainly in the mall. Um, but there's like highly saturated colors kind of all throughout. And um, it's certainly in the wardrobe, it's in the lighting. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, practical sets versus real sets. What is the balance here? And that's actually a question from Jeff Fagan too on Facebook, but I- I'm curious as well. Um, let's start with that mall. Was that a practical set that you guys outfitted or did you build that? No, it was a practical set. It's a, as far as I know, it's a mall that was scheduled for uh teardown and, uh, uh, and, um, and it was totally outfitted uh, by Chris Tru- Trujillo, our production designer. Uh, 360. It was it was sort of a, off the side of a mall, uh, of a working mall, um, and he took it to a place uh, that took months and months to to get together. And it took us about two months to light to get um, everything in there working off of a, a dimmer pack and all computerized so that we could flicker anything uh, uh, that, that, that the brothers wanted to see flicker or anytime there was danger there. Um, that, that mall, you could walk into any of the stores on a whim and it would be down to like uh, the jewelry, down to like the socks at the Gap. It was, uh, it was suitable. You could, at any given moment, you could, you could go in. They, the detail in there was very, very impressive. Wow. And um and it was uh, it was remarkable. I mean, I think that the um, I know the guys referenced uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High for some of the work we did in there, and um, it was uh, yeah, it was pretty remarkable uh, to bring to see brought to life. It really really felt nineteen nineteen eighties ish. That was our main big new set this year. We also had the um, the, uh, the the mayor's office. We had the, the town newspaper. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had our standing sets, which we didn't get into that much. You know, the, 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 uh, the buyer's house, which has seen a lot of, a lot of time on stranger things, as well as the Wheeler house basement, which didn't get visited to that, that much this year. Um, but those are standing sets, uh, the lab. I don't know if we got into the lab last year. I don't think we did. Um, we might've gotten in there for a second. I think what think Hopper and Joyce go back there for a second. Um, but uh, the mall certainly was uh, quite the achievement. Talk to me about your approach to lighting that. You said you had spent a couple months lighting it, but what was what was your approach to doing that? I mean, obviously, there's tons of practicals that we see in the neon, but can you dive a little bit more into that? Well, yeah, we worked, uh, again, with Chris and Jess Royale, uh, who's our uh, set, set uh, decorator, and, uh, uh, and they both help with lighting a lot. So we talked about bringing neon in, uh, which is very fragile stuff to bring in. And the idea of flickering neons a little bit, um, it's a little bit, you know, dodgy cause it's stuff can work and then it cannot work. And there's no explanation why, yeah. but, um, uh, through my, uh, electrical team, they spent literally two months, uh, rewiring everything in the place so that they could control it. Um, down to, you know, whichever you wanted to see turn on or off or flicker. And, um, it, it really took about two months to to get to get the lighting in there set, and we did that before we started rolling, um, and then uh, and then um, it worked. It, it was used uh, and morphed its way up until the very end, so um, you know all, all hell breaks loose in there. Were, were all the stores lit uh, um, appropriately for obviously for camera? You're lighting it, but was it like you said you could just walk in? When you just walked in normally, did it feel like a regular mall with that kind of like fluorescent top light and that sort of thing? Um, it, it did. I really embraced my inner uh, John Hughes on this, yeah. uh, as far as that goes. At least in the in the in the in the early early part of the of, of the season. Um, so you know, I, of course, uh, I would uh, add a little bit or subtract a little bit to try to bring out a little bit of contrast in in, in there. Um, you know, especially in like uh, in, in the kids in. Uh, in the gap hiding from the, uh, the monster. I tried to give it a little bit of, of contrast. Um, but, um, you know, it, 
it, I didn't want to stray from what it really would look like. And I think the thing that makes those 80s movies, including Fast Times and the John Hughes movies, look, you know, so believable is that they, um, they're they not, too, they don't take too far, too much, uh, uh, um, I'm trying to say, they, they don't they don't really get too far away from what it would really look like. Yeah. Um, now, that being said, we always try to add a little bit of something in there just to make it a little more special so that it's, it's, it's hyper real. But, um, but uh, yeah, the mall pretty much, you know, we had control of all the fluorescents overhead. And if there was a lights on that were behind camera, I would turn those off so that uh, so that anything uh, facing camera was a little bit down and it was brighter in the background, which always looks nicer. So that's uh, that's a little trick that um, that I like to do with, uh, uh, when shooting is uh, is have that kind of control. And it makes it so easy uh, when it's pre-programmed and we can access it uh, right away. Is this is this kind of like shooting in LED um, pre-programming lights? Is this the new normal now for shows and movies like at your level? Um, it's certain. You know, LED, LED lighting has certainly made uh, made us work a lot faster, and it's 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 helped us to work a lot faster. Um, and getting them all to this this space where I could turn off a bank overhead without having somebody to go unscrew bulbs, and they can just hit a hit a hit an iPad has certainly uh, changed the game. Uh, and that also includes we can change color balance on an iPad to anywhere in the mall we want it. Go to a fuchsia, go to a baby blue, go to normal tungsten light. Um, and that's something that's remarkable, where in the old days it would just be impossible. You'd have to re-gel the place and be down for a day and a half yeah. to do that. Um, so the technology is really there and really, really there to help us. And it certainly, um, certainly did this season. Now, obviously for tubes, you know, you're seeing a lot of LEDs, but are you incorporating LEDs? Because you can get like tungsten and LED, not tungsten, um, what's it, uh, Fresnels in LEDs. And like, have you sort of outfitted your entire lighting package in LED wherever possible? Well, I use a lot of Airy Sky panels on, uh, on the show. And um, recently I started using uh, LED uh, PARs and, and Fresnels, which I don't think I use, use too much on, on Stranger Things. We used uh, the 360s, I think they are, and the S, S60s, uh, I think that's what they're called, uh, the light panels. And they, they, you know, that combined with diffusions that I like to use, um, they really uh, they really kind of did everything. It's only when I really needed a harder harder source, uh, I'd have to move away uh, from, from that on this show and go back to more traditional Fresnel lighting, like a 20K, something hard or... You know, if we wanted to, if we wanted to pick up smoke through uh, through windows, I think like uh, I think it's episode five or six when Hopper and Joyce are going into that farmhouse and it's pretty dark. I think occasionally we hit some windows that were boarded up with some harder light uh, that just to pick up the the smoke and to, and the atmosphere. Um, so other than that, though, LED lighting really was I'd say ninety percent of, of the show hmm. this year. Do you run into any? challenges with having a full set of program lights like are there is there problems along the way that we may not be thinking about as far as like lights not working or flickering not doing what you want like what are some of the issues that you've run into um well a lot of times we use rechargeable astera bulbs which um i mean there's really not an issue there's not the the benefits way outweigh any issues i've seen uh yeah. with this I haven't, I'm going to knock on wood, but I haven't seen, um, uh, I haven't gotten to a set and all of a sudden the iPad's not working and not controlling it. And, um, I think those things are, are work, were worked out way ahead of time on this. And also, you know, I'm talking about our major standing sets where we're doing this. When we're walking into, um, a location, uh, we're not really doing all this kind of stuff. We're doing a little bit of it, but it's, it's more back to, back to basics, the traditional sure. lighting, um, uh, it's mostly for our standing sets and the mall really needed it because it had to go, it had to be prepared for the la for the finale, um, to just go kind of a uh, haywire. Let's take a quick moment and talk about magnanimous rentals over at magrents.com. Magnanimous rentals is an equipment rental house based in Chicago, but they ship anywhere in the country. So all of you guys, anywhere, if you're in the United States, you can take advantage of what I'm about to say. Um, so Magnanimous Rentals has a great inventory, and um, that's great. I mean, you obviously need a great inventory, but where they shine the most 
is their price. Their pricing is excellent. They're, I mean, their prices just can't be beat. You go to their site and their regular prices are fantastic. But then on top of the regular prices, they have these things called flash discounts. And you know it's a flash discount because it's in red and it's right there on your homepage. It's a nice bright red. And these are steeply, steeply discounted items, sometimes 50% off, which is insane. Um, but they're limited time. So you go to, the, like right now I go to their site and one of the flash discounts, just one, is the Red Weapon 8K. So if you wanted that, you go to the website, you click on the item. If it's on flash discount, great. You get to take advantage of the amazing price. And then you can set your delivery day to whenever your shoot is. But as long as you order while the flash discount is in place, you get to take advantage of the amazing price. Now, I've done this a couple times, and I got to tell you, when you get a product on flash discount that you, you know, needed for a shoot, you are going to be so happy because it's going to free up some money in your budget to go somewhere else or to go to you. The money you save is the money you earn. Think about that next time you're renting equipment. So make magrents.com one of the sites you check every day. You will not be let down. And, uh, you know, hopefully when you go, there'll be a flash discount that you really want. It's over there at magrents.com, M-A-G-R-E-N-T-S.com. And lastly, let's talk about Hedge. Hedge is a backup software for filmmakers. It allows you to, um, you know, back up your media in a professional way, you know. And professional, I mean, you can import multiple sources, like all your media cards, and send it to multiple destinations. So if you're like me and you want more than just one backup, you can have a couple of hard drives set, press transfer, and it just goes. It just goes. It's being done correctly. You don't have to worry that any files are missed. Uh, you get a notification on your phone if you have the Hedge Connect app for your phone when the transfer is done. So it's just so much more professional than willy-nilly dragging files all over your finder. It just doesn't make sense to do that anymore. I mean, we're all professionals here, and you should be using a professional tool to manage and back up your media, and that's what Hedge is. So head over to hedge.video forward slash go creative show. That'll give you a 20% off discount for the full license. And there's a whole bunch of different licenses there that you can check out. Um, and it's all there at hedge.video forward slash go creative show. All right, there's so much more interview to get to. So why wait another second? Let's get right to it with the director of photography for Stranger Things season three, Tim Ives. <laughs> Well, you had a lot of flickering in this season, um, and I, I was I was sort of thinking I haven't really used I haven't shot a lot of stuff with flickering, but when I have, the the issues that I've had were like how quickly they how quickly they go they dim back to nothing, and sometimes if it takes too long, you, you can't flicker as fast as you want because you're not getting to the black soon enough. Does that make any sense? Do you know what I mean? Like it the, does. I, I, you know, I try to have at least two or three different sources flickering uh, at alternate uh, times so that it's it's more of like a, it's more surreal. So it's not just on off on off on off. Um, you know, I didn't really see that with using the Astera tubes uh, uh, this year in our LED. In the past, uh, we were able to to get it to a spot. I remember I remember actually being on set and and, and having those issues you're talking about, but we worked it out with timing. And, um, and, uh, and, um, yeah, t timing and balancing of lights, you know, my, my gaffer, Dan Murphy, uh, had these little marimba shaker things that he designed about halfway through the show this year, where you could physically hold them in your hand, like Ricky Ricardo or, 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 you know, I love Lucy and, 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 and shake them. Um, and that would make the, the flickering, um, that would enact the flickering. No way. Uh, yeah, it was really, really cool. I have a video somewhere of me doing it or or somebody else. I think I gave it at one point. I gave it to Amy Forsythe, our our makeup artist, because she wanted she thought it was so cool. So she actually did the flickering for a scene. <laughs> no way. And, That's crazy. It's really cool. It was totally uh it was like virtual reality, basically. Um and and uh the more you sh it would it would it would respond to how, to how you were shaking it and how fast or how slowly you would. Um uh, so Dan created that and that's sort of a, a genius thing that enabled us to really sort of, you know, have that physical, uh, con connection with, with the, uh, the look of it. Yeah. Now I know you, you were, were you, um, did you do half the season and then go like back to back with another cinematographer? That's right. Okay. Uh, 
We yeah, Lachlan Milne was our alternate DP this year, and, and he did episodes uh, three and four and the finale. Um, so whereas I, you know, we we lit we, we got the mall going for him, and uh, so he could have all the choices he wanted. Uh, he he shot the finale and uh, did a, obviously an incredible job. How was that decision made? Like, do you guys work together, look at the scripts, and figure out who wants to do what, or like, how do you decide? Well. Obviously, the show's gotten bigger over the years, and this is a season. Uh, you know, the the the, the writing kind of happens uh, mostly before we start shooting, but there's always a little bit of uh, work to be done along the way as there's a sense of discovery, and we're seeing wh- what's working and what's not working. Um, so that you know, having another uh, a full on uh, uh, alternate DP this year enabled uh, me to have more time and the Duffers to have more time to flesh out the show. Um, you know, clearly we had a, we're a much bigger show than we've ever been this year. And, and, uh, there would have, it would have been very difficult for me to prep the entire thing and shoot the entire thing. Um, you know, in, in season seasons one and two, Todd Campbell came in and, uh, and, uh, I've talked about him in the past and yeah, he, yeah. he helped us out and he was not available to us this year, uh, when we needed somebody, uh, uh, to do more, more work. And, uh, and uh, the brothers found Lachlan. Um, I think he's from either. I think he's from New Zealand, not Australia. Uh, and he uh, he came in and um, and uh, yeah, it was great. It was really nice having having that that support. And uh, you know, um, and we needed it because it was it, it it was bigger. I don't think I could have uh, done the whole thing on the schedule that that um, that was presented to us. Now, are you guys are you involved in this in the episodes that you're not? that you're not shooting, you're not DPing. Are you involved? Like, do you ever, are you on set at all? Or are you completely just separated from it altogether doing, doing something else? Um, I'm always available, uh, especially for a DP who hasn't shot the show before, you know, to, 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 uh, for advice and for comments and for, for any help. But, um, by the time you got to the final episode, no, I, I, I left the show, after my episodes five and six and went straight to uh Fosse Verdon, which I shot in New York for uh, Tommy Kale and Lynn Miranda. And that was literally like walk off one set and onto another. Wow. Um, so, um, so no, I, I, I was in touch with those guys, but they, um, they successfully brought the ship into port on the, on their own for sure. By the way, we had um, Todd uh, Campbell on the show talking about homecoming and Mr. Robot. I mean, oh, yeah. what a talented DP. Holy crap. Yeah, he's he's great. He's really good. Um and a good friend too. That's awesome. I'm glad I I forgot that he did Stranger Things with you, but now that you're bringing it up, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember and his name sort of stuck in my head since we talked about him last time and um you know, it's we always get these guys on the show and they do I mean, he's super super talented. It's a it's an episode worth listening to you guys if you haven't seen it or heard it yet. It's um over there in Go Creative Show just search T O D Campbell, um, C A M P B E L L, and you'll find it. So we got a question here from Joe McLeish. He's actually my gaffer. I use him uh, a lot on my on my shoots for BC Media Productions. He wants to know, and I want to know too. How are you lighting those the scenes where Elle is in the black space, where she's walking around a little bit of water, but there's no reflections? Uh, obviously, there has to be some post work. I'd love to know how you are creating that look. Yeah, there there is some post work uh, for sure. Um, and it hasn't really changed that much since the, the very beginning. We've made the space a little bit smaller because we realized we could because there was a little bit of post work in there. But it's essentially uh, it started off essentially the size of uh, maybe something like a hockey rink with a uh, one or two inch lip around the side, all painted black, and then flooded to about you know uh, half an inch or so or a quarter inch so that you could still uh, walk through there. That gave the appearance of. Uh, Walking on water, uh, sort of, sort of thing. But then I also uh, wrapped the black theatrical uh, velours around the set uh, as well. Uh, difference between v- a, a theatrical velour and a regular piece of duvetine or um, or negative uh, is that it just really soaks up the light more, so it just disappears uh, even quicker. Mm. That that combined with uh, double uh, diffuse uh, top light. Uh, originally done, I think, with Kinos, and I think at the end we we, we were LED. Um, but actually, it might have even been space lights in the very beginning. Um, but now it's certainly uh, LED. Um, that sort of um, takes away from reflections because it's directly uh, uh, top lit. Um, 
So we don't you don't really see anything in the water other than the the uh, the reflection of the, the the actors and whatever's in the in the black void there at the moment. Um, I also you know we we crush the blacks down in those environments too. So you you don't see the borders and uh, any any extra work uh, that has to be done to clean it up uh, is done in post as far as extending it and making it feel like it's uh, going on forever. It's quite simple actually. Um, inspired by, uh, I think it's Glazer's film, Under the Skin. Uh, if you haven't seen that film, no, that's it. I'm going to search it right a, now. What, what is it? Uh, uh, Under the Skin, I think is what it's called. Um, it, it, that was the original inspiration for, uh, for this, um, uh, for this, this look, uh, huh. the original reference for it. But, um, yeah, it's, I'm uh, looking at pictures of it now and yes, I can, I can see it. Yeah, there you go. There's um, it, it's weird because it's like I feel like there's more reflection in at least the stills I'm looking at here. You've been able to remove a lot of that reflection. I think that that gives it a very um, that gives it a unique sort of twist on this theme. Well, I you know look, I wanted it to originally feel like it was dead light in there. Like she was in a halfway yeah. space. Of course, there was no sort of sort of uh, it was an, it was an underworld where where just light didn't really exist. Um, and uh, I think in under the skin, they're, they're, the viscosity of the water is more oily uh, uh, and reflective. Um, and we wanted it to feel to kind of disappear a little bit, a little bit more, uh, which would be the main difference, I think. Let's talk about um, one scene in particular. Uh, this question actually came from the audience too. Um, it's an, it's from Instagram, but there's no name here. It's just. Uh, I, I don't even know how to pronounce this. So sorry, I, I wanted to give you credit, but I can't. But it's on a, it's on Instagram. So if you um if you actually look at the Go Creative Show Instagram and, and search uh, in that post, you'll find it. But the question was, one of my favorite shots was when Erica first went through the vents, the reflection of the headlamp just looked really cool. Wondering if that was the only light source in the scene. Ah, uh, well, Lachlan and I both shot that. He may have gotten to her first. Um but uh, when I did shoot her in five and six, I think uh, it was pretty much the only source. I had a little bit of light in, uh, in the background, um, but lighting it from the front made it look a little unsexy, kind of flattened out the metal. Uh, but keeping the light behind her uh, and using the lights to sort of give us those flares and to backlight the metal uh, was definitely sexier, a sexier look. A lot of times, like in the tunnels in season two, uh, I like to just let a flashlight, uh, when the actors are coming towards us, I'll have somebody holding a card and they hit the, hit the card with the flashlight mm. and, and the card being white, uh, bounces back on them and illuminates them sporadically through the scene. And, uh, that's what I did with, with, with Priya. Um, and, uh, I'd have to look at, uh, uh, uh the other scenes, uh, a little closer to see if that's exactly what they did in, in theirs as well. As we round out our discussion about lighting, uh, we are going to talk about camera a little bit. Um, but before that, is there anything that you can think of in this season that you can point to as maybe like a particularly challenging scene to light um, or something that you know you want to draw our attention to that we may have not spoken about yet? Um, I think the scene in which uh, Hopper and Joyce uh, discover the underground Russian uh, lab uh, through the bed, you know, they, they pull the bed up and they go down the steps. Yeah. That scene, uh, we blacked out of uh, that, that building. Um, I wanted to shoot it at night, but the, of course, uh, you know, it's, it was, it would be tricky with kids, uh, uh, having to shoot, you know, uh, balance our day between kids and adults. So we blacked out, uh, tented out the, the whole thing, um, and lit it very, very low light, sometimes just light bulbs, uh, um, uh, kind of humming, uh, and pulsing, uh, in there due to the, uh, constraints put upon the, uh, the electrical grid with, uh, the Russian, um, uh, lab being underneath it. So mm. that scene is lit very, very sparsely, uh, but I think came out really, really well. And then we go into, we see for the first time this, uh, Russian space, which is bathed in red, uh, and where Hopper gets into a little bit of a fight with uh, with uh, a guy, and where we meet Alexi for the first time, um, that those scenes were were very new uh, new sets for me this year, and fun and challenging to figure out ways um, to to light them. But certainly, I, I kind of you know, really dig the sparseness of the uh, 
the way that the uh, the farmhouse came out. It must be just so fun to like have brand new set. Like you have you have your standbys. You have the ones that you're like, okay, I know how to do this. We know, you know, we know what has worked in the past. We're going to continue down that path. But then you get thrown these brand new sets. It just must be so fun to toss those in to a, a series like this. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it again. It's fun that the show evolves, and that's what keeps the viewers coming back. Is that it's you're going to get something new. It's not going to be a rehash of uh, of of what you saw last year. So, um, the, again, the people ab- above above the line here are. Uh, I got to give them the credit for that. I. I just uh, take what they write, and I um, I do the best I can with it. But the the writing this year, and the Hopper Joyce uh, relationship, and the Steve and Dustin. I mean, it's all it's all just uh, it's all super fun. I mean, it's ultimately just a really fun show. I love the um, the scene where they're in the mirror room in like the carnival. Um, oh God, what? Yeah, that was episode seven, I think. That's a, that's a Lachlan episode. Oh, how? Um, I mean, just were you involved at all in like how that was? I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I, I'm afraid I wasn't. That's a Chris Trujillo, uh, uh, production designer and Lachlan Milne uh, uh, question. Um, that was at the time where I had to uh, boogie to go to the other show, and I, I wasn't around at that point for for that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to say that. Say I don't have an answer for you on that one. Oh, what do you? Well, it, it's. Pretty kick-ass scene. <laughs> well, I hope you get a chance to talk to Lachlan about it too. I'd love to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. connect us. I mean, I'd love to. I'd love to have him on. You kidding me? I I will for yeah. sure. All right, let's talk about camera for a little bit. At the beginning of the show, we we did talk about kind of full frame um, versus thirty five, and uh, but let's just kind of get everybody back up to speed. Were you shooting? You were shooting reds for this, but you just changed your sensor. Yeah, we've changed the sensor throughout the show as as red has evolved. Um, and we're we went this year to the Monstro sensor 8K with a 7K uh, output um, to and using large format glass, the same Leica glass that we've been using before, but now uh, uh, their their version in, in large format. So, you know, evolving the show with red camera and Leica lenses has been um, something that's kept consistency, but also. Um, move the look forward uh you know if we, we, we i looked at other cameras which were fantastic and other lens possibilities for for changing it up this year and they were all great but ultimately we felt like uh the winning combination of uh you know of red and, and leica is something that we we wanted to stick with uh for continuity and um because they they haven't failed us in the least I'm just curious what your, um, you don't need to give me the whole list of cameras you were testing, but what was like the one that you, um, what was like the, the runner up for this? Was there any camera lens combo that you were kind of like, oh, maybe this could be it? Well, yeah, we looked at it. We looked at a bunch of lenses. I'd have to go back in my notes, but I, I don't think that there are that many options available to us uh, for, for um, large format glass. We looked at uh, Panasonic cameras. You looked at Airy cameras, the LF, uh, mm, and yeah. and uh, they're fantastic. And it looked it looked great. It just didn't come out looking like Stranger Things. That's the only thing. It's it's yeah. Dynamite cameras, and I will f- fully use them on, on other projects. But for this show, we're we're you know there's there's no reason to um, to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I know it's um uh uh. uh it, it just it's just it, right off the bat we could see with the with the monster and the and the like Athalia's that uh it was stranger things did um, you make any modifications to the lenses to kind of give it the look that it has um not on this show i've done that with other shows uh, like fossey verdon we did that uh with the pan our panavision lenses but on this show no um they were straight up and um i like to try to do as much as i can with lighting and uh, controlled lighting as far as the softness of an image goes or the hardness of an image goes. Yeah. So um, I try to do it mostly with lighting. Uh, the lenses on this one, uh, they were so new to me too, and and uh, I hadn't shot with them before, so I wasn't really ready to throw out what uh, all the all the incredible engineering that Leica did to uh, and uh, to modify the glass or to or to you know, knock it back a bit. I didn't really, you know, we have I, as what I mentioned before the the black promise I like to use, which is a very simple filter, but it just gave me a little bit of uh, degradation and in, in the highlights that I liked, and I felt like I wouldn't need to go much further than that uh, with the new format. Besides, 
you know, shooting, like I mentioned before, a little bit closer to wide open. Uh, is this a single camera show? It's, it's uh, well, we call it a single camera show, which usually means there's two cameras. <laughs> um, so uh, we always have two cameras, and usually they're both working. Uh-huh. Um, we like to have very tight eye lines on this show. So at that, at, in those moments, we usually stick with one camera. Uh, so, uh, so the island doesn't get too far off from, yeah. uh, the characters. Uh, and then w- when we have stunt scenes or larger groups, uh, when the, a lot of kids are together or you know, a larger group scene, we'll, we'll, we'll bring in a third camera as well. Certainly for stunts, there's, there's, you know, if you're blowing something up or if a monster is crashing through us through a ceiling, We'll, we want to get as many angles as we can on it because there's only a certain amount of times you can do that. So when you say tight eye lines, you're saying that you wouldn't be able to hide a camera uh, behind the person. I guess if you're, if you're shooting one direction, you wouldn't be able to hide the camera shooting the other direction because they're facing each other almost uh, uh, too profily. Is that what you mean? Well, that's kind of cross covering, uh, uh, which is when you have one camera over one shoulder and one over the other one and you're getting both actors at the same time. That is harder to do because it's hard to light that in a way that that's really um, that, that that's as nice as if you're only having one camera. But there are times when I do that when it's a completely it's a very emotional scene, or in the act we feel like the actors are going to probably expand on the direction and and do something a little different. Yeah. Uh, and at those moments, you're, you you have to sacrifice a little bit of a tight eye line. But what I was saying, uh, what I was meaning by that was really when we're in coverage on one person, if I get the camera as close to the actor who's off camera as possible. Usually that actor has got his, his or her face, right. You know, they're almost sitting on the dolly next to us and mm. just with their face right next to the map box. So that, so that the actor we're filming is looking just camera left or camera, right. That makes us, that really brings us into the immediacy of their situation when, when they're, when it almost feels like they're looking at us, but they're, you know, they're, they're not, that would be, that would be wrong. But the uh, it bring it, it puts us in into the mindset of uh, of the actors. The closer eye line you get, and there are times where we don't want to be inside their head as much, or we think that it's not, you know, or we want it to be a little confusing. And then maybe we will spread the eye line a little bit further in those situations. Um, but uh, usually we're on the coverage is just on one person at a time. And like I said, unless the scene uh, is, is is delicate or uh, or. Uh, or, um, you know, it has been improvisation in it. In comedy, a lot of the times you do two cameras uh, across coverage because the actors are, aren't going to do it the same way twice. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it'll, I imagine comedy just gets more and more stale the more you do it. You got to get that first, that first reaction. That's my experience in, you know, working on Girls uh, on, for HBO, um, the show before I did Stranger Things, that... Yeah. We had to do that a bunch of times, and it was tricky, but uh, we always found a way to do it and that, so it looked good. But yeah, you, you get some performances that's you know when when the actors are just riffing and the pacing and the timing, it's like you know it's almost impossible to duplicate. listening to the premiumbeat.com song of the week this one is called stranger things among us by julian bell premiumbeat.com is where to go for all of your royalty free music and sound effects head over to premiumbeat.com to get access to a collection of thousands of royalty free tracks and get this they're as low as 49 bucks each 49 to under 50 bucks And you don't just get the individual song, you get cut downs, you get loop sets, you get stems. And what you really get is the ability to customize the track to fit your project perfectly. And that's one of the many, many, many reasons why I use Premium Beat. And you should be using them too. So head over there, premiumbeat.com. Lastly, let's talk about Rule Boston Camera. Rule is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. They have an amazing inventory. And when I tell you, these guys, they've been around for over 35 years. 
okay? When major motion pictures come through, Boston and New England, most of them are using bull, uh, rule Boston camera, you know? So if those guys are using them, they gotta be good for us too, right? And they're using them because their inventory is gigantic. You're always going to find what you want. Cameras, lenses, grip gear, lighting, communications, uh, camera dynamics, easy rigs, ready rig, everything that you need is there at Rule. So they've got the inventory covered. But what makes Rule different and even more special than anywhere else is their service. They understand that production is mission critical and they've got your back. You know, you're going to get expert advice in pre-production, technical guidance when you take the equipment out for your shoot, and they're committed to supporting you no matter what you need while on location. So we're talking about peace of mind. That's really what we're talking about. And especially um, when we're in the production industry, the last thing you want is to be worried about your equipment. Is it going to arrive on time? Is it going to work? Am I going to be that? It's just, it's just gone. All of those worries are gone. You get what you want. It's at a great price. And you're going to know exactly how to use it and feel the support that rule is there and they have your back. And it's true. It's the real thing. This is what these guys are all about. They were our very first sponsor, our very first, and they're still with us today. And whether they sponsor the show or not, I would always use them um, because of those reasons. All right. They are a staple in the industry here in Boston. And uh, you guys should experience the rule difference as well. So it's all there at rule.com, R-U-L-E.com. All right. Let's get to the conclusion of our interview with Tim Ives, uh, the director of photography for Stranger Things right now. <laughs> Can you talk to me a little bit about your focal length choices? I noticed a lot this year and, and other years too, but for some reason this, this year just popped out to me more. Um, a lot of close-ups with wide angles, yes. and, uh, which I love. I mean, I love that look, but a lot of symmetry, a lot of like faces and eyes right there in the center. Um, tell me about that. Um, we love a wide angle lens and a close-up. We just know that it works on Stranger Things and it brings, it, it, it's a little Spielbergian, um, uh, and it, it, you know, it just looks, it, it gives us the feeling that we want, that we are right in there with the actors, with the scene. We, you know, it puts us right in there with the group. Yeah. So you really, really feel like you're, you're, you're not watching it from afar, but you're right in there. Whereas more telephoto lenses and more formal lenses, uh, it's being more presented to you. But in this, in this case, we wanted to feel like, like we're actually in it with the, with them which I think helps with those wide angle close-ups. Um, traditionally, a regular 35 millimeter lens that I love for that is a 29 or a 32. Uh, both are excellent uh, for close-ups. The 29 can get a little bit of a big head kind of thing, so you gotta be careful. Yeah. Um, and as far as symmetry goes, uh, we've always been a pretty symmetrical show. Um, however, I think that I would say this season, we definitely paid more attention to that dead center sort of idea, the rule of thirds, which, um, which was, um, oh my God, the director, uh, The Shining. Come on. Oh, Kubrick. Who, Kubrick. Kubrick, Kubrick, yes. Uh, that's sort of his rule, the rule of thirds. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, we, we followed that as much as we, as much as we could. Yeah, you, re you really notice it. And I, I mean, I love the look of it. Like, it, it, for, it just lends itself to that time period for some reason for me, too. I don't know why. It's not like, it's not like there are no other decades where that technique is used, but something about just that the little bend in the face and it, it all looks natural, but like the way a, wi a wide angle close up incorporates the background is just, it's so it's, I don't know. It's so much more alive than shooting with a long focal length. Um, I don't know. It's just, it just really works for me. And I think it also, it helps with like the pace of the show. Cause it, it's very, um, it's very, there's a lot of momentum in it. Yeah. And also, you know, when we do those push-ins too, it, it, it makes them much more uh, impactful when you're going from a wide to a close, a three foot move on a wide angle lens um, is is huge compared to a three foot move on a on a medium or a long lens. You almost don't even notice it in those. So, I mean, for that you know reason, sometimes we do the the push-ins on a little bit longer lens, and we don't want them to feel that big. But for those moments when a character is about to say "run," you know, those are on a wide angle lens, um, and. Uh, and uh, we, we, we liked that an awful lot on the show, for sure. The two things I noticed this year that were different and really extraordinary is I feel like the editing was tighter and faster than ever before, and the sound design 
was louder and constant and just every 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 time a doorknob turned it was like the loudest sound in the world and it was so great like i've i was so captivated by the sound and the editing of this season i know i was not involved in it but it makes complete sense that this was something that was not a happy accident it was thought out and and uh, and brought brought to life via the editing and the and the sound and we also this year had um a little less figuring out, more running. You know, we had Hopper and, jo- and Joyce running, running. Yeah. The camera this year just, you know, didn't stop moving. I've mentioned to you before about our use of the Technocrane, and uh, and we, we we were using it a lot this year. The camera um, was always going with our characters, and I think that's another way to make you feel you're part of, you're right in there with them versus seeing it from afar, you know, uh, but the Technocrane is, uh, is, uh, is our tool that we just keep getting better and better using at, I think. So was it mostly Technocrane or were you doing like, um, uh, I want to say gibble, but that's not the word. What is it? Um, Steadicam, uh, yeah. dollies. Like what, what were you mostly using? Well, you know, we're, when we're, uh, when we're a little more traditional, when there's room for it, we use a dolly. Um, and, uh, and again, it's the camera work is, uh, with restraint, certainly a little bit wide angle lens, but with restraint and very cinematic, um, very little handheld unless there's a, a confrontational fight or a moment. Um, uh, and Technocrane was used um, uh, for a lot of exteriors and some interiors um, when we needed the camera to either push past something, push through something, um, or uh, or or arrive somewhere from a, from another uh, height. Um, and the Technocrane also offers flexibility too, as far as changing up a shot or really designing a shot that, uh, is free of physical constrictions that a dolly would, would impose it on. So, um, you know, if, you know, it's not a cheap tool, but, uh, it's one that works well for us for sure. Mm. We got a great question from, um, Jose Mojic on Twitter. He's interested in knowing, um, where you think technology is going. Uh, he said, in many ways, TV tech has surpassed cinema with HDR, Dolby Vision, uh, HLG. I don't know what that is, HLG. And soon 8K. What is next? So just, a, I guess, a basic question about where where do you feel cinematography, filmmaking is going from a technology standpoint moving forward? What do you think? I think I, that's a good question. And I, I think that the tools are getting a little smaller and lighter and easier to use um, you know, for years, we, everything was monstrous and heavy and hard to get to remote locations. And now it's, it's easier. It's getting, it's just getting easier to bring, uh, a vision to, to life. Um, as far as the clarity of images goes and 8k and HDR, um, you know, I mean, HDR feels like a very modern tool, um, and has to be used, I think, uh, with restraint and very carefully, so that the image doesn't look uh, uh, cartoonish uh, in its in, in its uh, rendering of colors in the background and the foreground. Um, it is a remarkable tool, and I think that people will be able to really see that and take advantage of that as as televisions become uh, uh, um, more HDR friendly, and and you and. And the more, as it grows, you know, people replace televisions over the years and they'll be getting HDR type TVs. Um, that, that's something that's, that's great. I'm also noticing the, the Sony line has a master series where, where, uh, they're able to, um, with metadata really get the settings that the creators of the, of the images have, uh, have set, um, uh, the, the, the picture at so that you can see it as, as the creators intended. And that to me is the most interesting uh, thing because, um, you know, a lot of TVs that come straight out of the the major uh, stores come with a more of a uh, uh, sports-based setting. And some people don't change that. And then all of a sudden the the look of any show, whether it's Stranger Things or whether it's The Godfather or Inception can look like it's shot on, on videotape and, and, not at all like 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 we were hoping it would look like or or we had created it to look like. So I think that hopefully televisions will evolve to help the viewer see see things exactly as 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 we were thinking. Um, as far as 8K or larger goes, I gosh, I think it, I think it looks so good right now. I can't imagine 
you know, what's next. I don't know if we'll be moving away from a film look as we get further and further away from actual celluloid. Um, you know, I, I'm from an era where we shot film. I learned on film. So that is sort of an aesthetic that I'll, I'll hold on to uh, um, until it's uh, not needed for a, for a certain project. But um, it could be moving away from that a little bit. I'm not sure. Um, it's to be seen. But as far as as far as uh, what we have today, I mean, when we started Stranger Things and what we have today, it's it's been an incredible leap um, in technology and the tools that we use to to make the shows. You had said that Sony's Master Series. Are you saying the metadata is like each program would carry its own and then change the TV, like depending on which show you're you're watching? Well, I think so. I, um, that sounds I think amazing. So it does. And I know that Netflix has partnered with a television. I think it is Sony to do just that. Um, wow. Um, but I, I'm, you know, I, I am in need of getting a new TV this fall. So I, uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. I'll send you an email, <laughs> yes. which you know what I find, but it's, uh, Oh no, we need to do a whole show about it, about your, your quest for a new TV. <laughs> That's what we should do. Well, I would actually, if I find the right answer, I would love to give your audience the answer to that because yeah. I mean, even my friend's houses, when I go visit them and they're watching, you know, um, what is that great show? Is it Out, the Out, Outlander? I was at a friend of mine's house and she was watching it and it just didn't look right. And it was all, had the video setting. I'm like, I know this show looks beautiful. You get, you know, uh, in a very fraternal uh, sort of sort of way. I'm like, I'm not letting my fellow uh, cinematographer be represented this way. Yes. You know, I adjusted the television for her. But, um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that this is the case because everybody should see the shows as intended. And not um, any other way, if that's at all possible. We're running out of time, but I just want to take a couple of seconds and talk about the color in this. Did you? Can you talk to me about the color workflow? Were you involved in any of the uh, post color work, um, creating creating LUTs for on set, anything like that? Well, we work. Um, Skip Kimball is our is our colorist. He's also James Cameron's colorist, um, and. You know, while doing this, he was redoing um, the uh, or, or uh, uh, bringing bringing uh, Titanic uh, back for a, a, a remastering. Um, but in any case, I work mostly with Skip uh, as we're shooting and in front of shooting um, to get the LUTs on set. And this year, we had a different camera. Our first LUT from the previous season didn't work at all with the the new technology uh, that the monster sensor brought. So we had to sort of go back and bring that out. Um, on set, and uh, and it's gotten so easy that I can give Skip my comments, and he he'll from his beautiful studio in L.A. He'll send me ten minutes later, you know, or as however long it takes, uh, a new LUT that we will just uh, an email download it right into the camera, and there it is, and we can see it instantaneously. Wow! Um, so that that the ability to do that is just you know is mind blowing. Um, so. We got to a spot where we felt really good on set. We don't use a DIT on Stranger Things. Um, we, so the in-camera look, uh, I want to get uh, um, as close as possible as what the final is going to look like or what we perceive the final to look like. Because um, I know that once, especially this season, once I leave the show, um, I'm going to be busy with other things. And it's posts in L.A. and I'm not always out there. And, um, and so I try to get as much in-camera as possible. That being said, you know, Skip and the, working with the brothers out there, they um, uh, we wanted more saturation this year. The brothers wanted it for that summertime feeling, and um, Skip provided that uh, as uh, also with you know great shading and windows and and technique that um, that he's so good at. Yeah, it, it just looks really good. This season was amazing. It looked great. I've got one question left, um, and I want to talk to you. We've been we've been trying to throw this into as many shows as we can. Do you have like one piece of gear that you have to have with you on every shoot? It can be anything. It, be, it could be big, small. One of our last guests, um, man, I can't remember which one it was, but he had said a, a water bottle was like what he uses because he shoots through it to get like lens artifacts and stuff. Um, anything like that that right. you take with you all the time? Um, it, it's a it's a very difficult tool to find, but it's um, it's one of those big pens that have four different colors in it. <laughs> So it's what? not difficult to find it all. I take <laughs> How are you those. using that? Well, I have that around my on a on a lanyard around my neck, and then I have a I have a, a bunch of uh, notepads that I, I get every year from probably from Muji, um, 
that I put in my back pocket and I'll label them for each episode. What I do is I uh, use that for blocking when we have a scene. And Stranger Things, you have to know, we have, always have a lot of people on in a scene. Uh, I'll draw an overhead of the scene as the directors are blocking it, as we're blocking it, uh, uh, with different colors for different actors, and then I'll dot their movements in so that when we go to make a plan for the scene, once we've seen the seen the blocking of it, I now have an overhead of seeing where they're all going because like, it's very difficult to remember it when they're all moving around. Um, and I can plan out with camera angles the shots we need to get the scene. Um, and uh, then we can organize that scene in a way so that it's most efficient for time. Um, that is a piece of paper and the pen is the greatest tool I have outside of our, uh, you know, our, our motto of lights, lenses, and cameras. Um, I, you know, the, the, the bottle thing is a cool thing too. Um, and, uh, we don't usually have that on, uh, on this show cause it's just, um, we just, we I guess we're just more objective in, 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 in the way, way it's filmed, but I'm telling you being, having that pad of paper that fits in my back pocket and that pen, uh, makes me who, uh, you know, I, I, I know I have a little ADD in me. Cat keeps me organized. It keeps me, keeps me going. So that's my, my biggest tool. And I would suggest to any cinematographer to do the, to, to try it out because it'll, it can save your butt when, when you're, when you're a little fried, especially. I love that. And the cinematographer was Jacob Iyeda from uh, Chernobyl. That's the one that had the water bottle trick just to just for those people that are in, anticipating what the answer was to that question wow. but yeah that was his chernobyl tool. chernobyl if you guys haven't seen it it's phenomenal i know and how great should, was that that should take the emmys this year for my my money it, it, i mean everybody's work is great but it, it, it was really good oh uh, it really was all right tim eyes thank you so much for being on uh the show we didn't really get to talk about fossey that much but you did mention it and um <laughs> Uh, and uh, I mean, it's a really, really cool looking show. And you guys should definitely check this out. Um, uh, first of all, your stuff, timives.com, T-I-M-I-V-E-S.com. On Instagram, uh, Tim Ives as well. Your Instagram is awesome. So you guys should certainly be following him. Um, do you want to just give a quick plug to Fosse? Because we didn't really get to properly promote it. And it's really good and worth people checking out. Oh, uh, well, it's on FX. It's streaming. You can see it on Apple TV or on FX uh, streaming. Uh, directed by Tommy Kale, who famously uh, is a director, a Broadway director of Hamilton and the Heights. Lynn Manuel Miranda is our exec producer. Uh, stars Sam Rockwell, Michelle Williams, two of our finest, two of the finest actors I've ever worked with. Um, and it chronicles the life of Bob Fosse, who was a Broadway choreographer, dancer, uh, and then film director and Broadway director as well. He was a he was a huge presence on Broadway and in in film in the early seventies. Uh, but the little known story is uh, how much his wife uh, was the unsung hero of, of his success. Uh, Gwen Verdon, portrayed by Michelle Williams, who I'm pretty confident will take home an Emmy for for her amazing performance in it. It's it's uh, it, it's night and day from Stranger Things, but it's um it's a beautifully told told show that I'm extremely proud of. Yeah, so I w- I've been saying it incorrect. I'm just calling it Fosse, which I guess is the whole point of the show. It's called <laughs> Fosse Verdon. And um, you guys should check that out. And I'll put a link to it in the show notes too. So you can see that as well. Um, Tim, thank you so much for being on. The show's amazing. Your work is great. And already excited for your next appearance. You're going to be the most appeared guest on this show. I can feel it. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you again, Ben. It's always nice to talk to you. I want to thank Tim Ives for coming back on the show talk about Stranger Things Season 3. It's too bad we didn't get too much into Vossi Verdon, which is a really, really... I said Vossi. Vossi Verdon. I got my F's and V's screwed up. Vossi Verdon. Too bad we didn't get to talk about it, because it's an amazing show. And you guys should definitely go and check that out. You will love it. Yes, complete opposite ends of the spectrum of Stranger Things, but that's what makes it great. Go and see Tim's other work. See how versatile he is. I also want to thank the two people that make the show work behind the scenes. We've got Connor Crosby, our producer. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com. And Matt Russell over at gainstructure.com for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. We love audience questions. So if you want to have your question asked on Go Creative Show, make sure you follow us on social media. And you should also be following our sponsors. Hedge.video, Rule Boston Camera, Magnanimous Rentals, Shutterstock, and Premium Beat. Support those that support us. See you next week.